Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Roxanne Marcel Shaw. On behalf of the Professional Standards Councils, it is a pleasure to welcome you to the first Professional Standards Forum of 2023. We have a full house with participants joining us from across Australia and internationally. To start our forum today, I would like to share with you an acknowledgement of country produced by ABC Television as a demonstration of our respect for the traditional custodians of the lands from which we are joining this forum. Acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of lands, waterways and skies across Australia. From Mulgana country in the west to Bundjalung country in the east, from Luchuita in the south to Saibai Island in the Torres Strait, this continent is home to hundreds of different nations whose knowledge has helped shape and evolve our understanding of the land and seas. Today, we pay respect to Elders past and present and recognise the contribution of all First Nations peoples to the land we live, learn and play on. Have a deadly day. I am in Sydney on Gadigal Country and extend a warm welcome to First Nations and all participants. I'm delighted that so many of you are joining us today from professional associations with approved professional standard schemes, from associations intending to apply for schemes, from government and co-regulators, and from the broader professional standards community of practice. The forum is an initiative of the professional standards councils aimed at bringing associations and professional standards regulators together to hear from experts from industry, from associations, from academia, and from the councils. Today's forum is on fit for purpose regulation, lessons from reviews. Our panel for today's forum features four experienced and eminent speakers on professional standards, who have all been involved in conducting or responding to reviews with a focus on ensuring professional standards, regulatory arrangements are fit for purpose in evolving environments. We will have panel presentations from Professor Ron Patterson from the University of Auckland, followed by Peter Gow, the Chair of the Australian Research Council Project Constructing Building Integrity, Raising Standards Through Professionalism, first up. We will take a short break and then we will come back together to hear from our last two panel presenters, Michael O'Neill, the Chief Executive Officer of the Tax Practitioners Board, and Tina Lisa Sexton from the Professional Standards Councils. We will then open up to discussion before we conclude with remarks from the Professional Standards Council's Chair, John Vines. So to move to our panel, our first speaker is Ron Patterson, Emeritus Professor of Law at the University of Auckland and Senior Fellow at the Melbourne Law School. He was New Zealand Health and Disability Commissioner from 2000 to 2010 and Parliamentary Ombudsman from 2013 to 2016. He has led several major policy advisory reviews and recently chaired an independent review into the regulation of lawyers and legal services in New Zealand. Ron, I invite you to share lessons from the work that you have done throughout your career in advancing professional standards, together with the lessons learned from your most recent review in New Zealand. Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you, Roxanne, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a uh, privilege to, to talk to you about a subject dear to my heart. Uh, fit for Purpose Regulation Lessons from Reviews. Uh, and on the side of the screen, there is the cover uh, from the final report that uh, I uh, recently delivered to the New Zealand Law Society after a year-long independent review. So I thought I'd just start with some broader thoughts on uh, the context. I've tried to understand a little of the work of the Professional Standards Councils. Uh, and it seems to me that there are some common themes uh, in various reviews of professions uh, that I and others have been involved in and the work of the, of the councils. The first of those themes is the emphasis on prioritising the interests of consumers, which we refer to as the public interest, over the interests of 
the members of the regulated profession, important though those interests are, stating very clearly that the, the purpose of, of regulation of a profession is uh, to put the public interest first. And in doing that, we we also seek always, and we think of this as sort of light touch or, or right touch regulation, to do so, to regulate in a way that promotes the professionalism of the members of that profession. What we don't want is heavy handed regulation that actually undermines professionalism. And Roxanne referred to my work as the New Zealand Health and Disability Commissioner, somewhat akin to the Health Care Complaints Commission in New South Wales or the Health Ombudsman in, in Queensland. And I always conceived of the role there as holding up a mirror for the profession and the members of the profession to consider, did they think uh, in this particular case, they'd met the high standards they set for themselves. And obviously, in referring to standards, we're always looking, and I know this is a, a mission of the PS uh, Professional Standards Councils, to improve those standards. Maintenance of public confidence in a profession is also truly really an important and separate aspect of the public interest. And complaints are a topic dear to my heart, uh, in addition to the years as uh, parliamentary ombudsman, which in New Zealand is sort of complaints central for the country and is also the combined uh, role of Freedom of Information Commissioner. I had the uh, privilege of, of chairing our banking ombudsman scheme, which is a private dispute resolution scheme, but with an independent chair. Through these different complaint schemes, we look to ensure appropriate accountability of members of a profession, and we want a scheme that is in a system that will be seen by members of the public, by consumers, as being independent, fair, it needs to be fair for them, but of course fair for the uh, person complained about, accessible, efficient, which includes of course timeliness, and effective in terms of the, the remedies that it comes up with. So we talk about what is fit for purpose regulation. And here I refer to, to work that I did in 2017 and 2020 for uh, the Medical Board of Australia and the Australian Health Practitioners Regulation Authority. And I was asked in light of that work to give an address to an international conference on how can regulators main, uh, maintain public trust and confidence in the face of, of changing public expectations. And you might wonder what those images are. So the top left was a photograph that I took, uh, having not noticed the little sign saying no, no photographs, in a Melbourne general practice waiting room. And one of the many signs there is to alert patients that one of the doctors is practicing subject to a chaperone re requirement imposed by the Medical Board of Australia. Traditionally, all over the world, medical regulators, if they have a, uh, a, a registrant who's facing an allegation of uh, se sexual impropriety, the traditional response is simply to say, well, we'll put a chaperone in place in the meantime. Tom Monagall, the young man from Melbourne, a law student who told his story publicly, was aghast when he discovered after he reported inappropriate uh, touching by a neurologist that the neurologist who in fact already had a, a track record, a previous complaint of similar behaviour, was allowed to continue to practice and in the course of that practice uh, was then subject to a further complaint because of chaperone was not a foolproof mechanism. So why do I give you this example? Because it's very easy to get used to certain ways of doing things. We think, you know, here's a nail, we'll use a hammer. And fit for purpose regulation is regulation that looks at what current community expectations are and considers whether the tools we have been using are, are still appropriate. And in that review, I recommended moving completely away from the use of mandated chaperones and that's what's happened in Australia and is now happening in a number of jurisdictions, including the US. I think there's a very important balance between professionalism and regulation. And there's the uh, the photograph there from uh, Philippe Petit, uh, man, uh, the man walking across the wire. I think it was the early 1970s, the then Twin Towers in Manhattan. And a the theme of my book, The Good Doctor, What Patients Want, 
uh, is how we can get that balance between encouraging professionalism, which is actually the best way to maintain and improve standards, but also having this safety net of regulation and intervention if necessary when standards have not been met, when the floor, the minimum, has not been complied with. So I say all that by way of introduction to the particular review that I'm asked to, to speak to you about now. So over the past year, the New Zealand Law Society had commissioned a review into the legal services regulatory framework, and that was the review that I was called upon to chair. And you might ask yourself, well, well why would the legal profession and its current body, which is both the regulator and the representative body, what, why would it do this? And, and indeed, my very first question when they approached me to be chair is, well, why isn't this coming from the government? Well, our government had other priorities and the um, Law Society felt that it needed to take a look and get independent advice on its framework. The photograph there shows um, what was for our country the sort of Me Too moment when students were protesting in the street after it came to light that interns or law clerks had been indecently assaulted, allegedly, and certainly had been propositioned by a senior partner of a leading law firm, Russell McVeigh. This exploded in the face of the regulator and of the profession. And then off the back of that, concerns about bullying and poor mental health in the profession. And I know that these issues have also been faced by the legal profession in Australia including, of course, in relation to former Justice Hayden and, and, and the High Court and the uh, law clerks who came forward. Complaints are major issues in our lawyers' complaint service in, in New Zealand that was um, making both the lawyers and the complainants unhappy because of the delays and the lack of transparency. Internationally, beginning with England and Wales in, two, in, in 2004 with a review by Sir David Clementi and then a number of other jurisdictions, including Ireland and Scotland, uh, obviously the review that led to the Uniform Law in Australia, more recent review of the in British Columbia. Internationally, uh, the legal profession has been looking at how it regulates and whether or not self-regulation is fit for purpose in 2023. For us in New Zealand, and I know for, for you in Australia, cultural expectations, particularly for our Indigenous peoples, for us, our Māori, uh, is a very important context. Um, and we have our Te Tiriti or Treaty of Waitangi, and this was also something about which our current legislative framework is completely silent. So uh, should the regulatory framework incorporate specific reference? And of course, the marketplace for legal services has been changing. And questions arise whether the current framework is anti-competitive uh, and is actually preventing innovation and competition in the delivery of legal services. So we had very wide terms of, of reference, and I don't intend to labour these, but it's becoming quite fashionable for these sorts of reviews. I also had the, the, the privilege and responsibility of chairing our mental health and addiction inquiry for the New Zealand government in 2018. And similarly, very, very wide terms of reference, which looked in part to cultural factors, but also look at very specific issues around here, complaints and which legal services are regulated and so forth. So that was our task and we had a year to do it. The Law Society in New Zealand went through a uh, consultation process on what the terms of reference should be and then went through a selection process to appoint the panel. We started our work on the 1st of March last year. We were asked to see if the current uh, framework was fit for purpose. We put out a discussion document, as you do in these circumstances. Of course, it's always difficult to engage the public and even here to engage the profession because lawyers are busy people and many of them simply didn't have the, the time or the sense of urgency to engage in the process. They're a bit more focused right now that the report has come in. So we went through the sort of standard process of putting out a discussion document and consulting with key groups, including importantly, key consumer groups and the various leading stakeholders, the Bar Association and the various representative groups in our country. And as we often do in our part of the world, in the Antipodes, I think we, we know how important it is to look internationally. We certainly 
uh, looked across the Tasman and benefited from uh, meetings with the New South Wales Legal Services Commissioner and with the Victorian Legal Services Commissioner and Board. In the UK, launched specifically in London, Dublin and Edinburgh with regulators and, and regulatory experts there. And we're a very connected world these days and there's a lot of expertise that one can draw on. So all of that was background to how we went about our review. So it was the framework fit for purpose? Our current legislation dated from 2006. It didn't set out any regulatory objectives. It's hard to know what the purpose of your regulation is if you don't spell out clearly what the regulator is supposed to be doing. No treaty reference, more about title protection than risk to consumers, restrictive in terms of the sort of models that you could have, you know, alternative business structures were not possible. And it very much focused on the regulation of individuals and had a very prescriptive model for handling complaints. The photograph there was uh, from a public meeting in the hut, which is just north of Wellington uh, in the early 1990s. Members of the public clients of a law firm, Renshaw Edwards, who had been defrauded. It turned out the two partners were both crooks and neither knew the other was and to the tune of millions of dollars. And every member of the profession was levied for, I think, $10,000 to, to cover the payments that needed to be made. So that, would, that had actually been part of the impetus for the 2006 Act, which said that it was introducing a more responsive regulatory framework. But as I've said, times change and it's proving not to be responsive enough. So what did we recommend in our recent report? So our key recommendation is for a new independent regulator akin to the, the Legal Services Commission and Board in Victoria or to the model that they've adopted in Ireland. We don't believe it's realistic in 2023 to say that for the legal profession compared with just about every other profession in New Zealand, save for the teachers, to continue to be by statute both the regulator and to have the specific function of still being the representative body to speak out on behalf of lawyers. As a result, it's effectiveness and efficiency as a regulator was being compromised, but also lawyers have felt that it's not able to stand up for their interests in the way that they would, would wish. We noted the trend internationally for independent regulation. Our cost-benefit analysis suggested that this would, if anything, be over time less expensive than the current model. And we've opted, instead of the current model of a board of five through elections and a representative council of another 25, which is just everybody who served on that, that body has described as unwieldy, modern governance would suggest a smaller board. We've, suggest, we've said eight skills and competence base with, in our view, we think there should be four members from the profession and four public members not from the profession. Importantly, with a careful nominations process insulated from, from government, uh, obviously for the legal profession, the role of upholding the rule of law is important, and so you need to protect the independence. And we do, of course, envisage continuing an important role for the law society as the national representative body. So this would require legislation. For those of you who don't know, that's the New Zealand Parliament, the Beehive, where the executive is located, and the older building is the actual parliament. And we've said that there should be uh, an overarching treaty clause, which now appears in 60 different pieces of legislation in New Zealand, but is still somewhat contentious. Spell out the purpose of the regulator, its primary objective to protect the public interest and preserve but update the lawyer's fundamental obligations, importantly with a new fundamental obligation relating to maintenance of professional competence. Cultural issues have been a major uh, factor in the New Zealand legal professional context where, yes, we have seen women advance in the profession and yet still not the representation we would expect at the senior levels, whether that's as barristers or as King's Counsel or as partners of law firms, Māori and Pacific and Asian lawyers are not progressing in the way we would expect to see, given the way in which our population is changing. And so we came up with a range of recommendations to try and provide a more supportive environment, recognising, and I'm sure all the professional associations here today will recognise this, that you can't really legislate for these things. You, you can legislate for some greater transparency and you can legislate to prevent discriminatory conduct. But beyond that, you really need to create an environment 
which will enable the flourishing of you know different cultures and ethnicities but also for younger lawyers so that we don't see what has been referred to as the great resignation with so many younger lawyers in Australia and New Zealand and other countries not finding the practice of law to be what they had hoped for. We were asked to consider the scope of regulation. So should it be simply regulation of, of lawyers, as it currently is, with some fairly narrow reserved areas, primarily related to litigation and appearing in court? Or should it go further because of the concern that others can provide legal services and are providing legal services in, for example, employment advocates? And cases do come to public attention where there appears to have been some pretty shoddy or substandard services. Having said that, for our country, as many, as with many uh, jurisdictions, access to legal services is a major issue. Uh, and, and that we decided ultimately that to further extend the regulation, because regulation comes with cost, would risk actually making access even harder and that there were other lighter touch ways of regulating those other providers uh, without putting them under the sort of full regulation that we have for lawyers. We've suggested a new freelance lawyer model, which has been adopted in the uh, in the United Kingdom, make it easier for people to uh, to set up shop and make it easier for employed lawyers to provide pro bono services. And importantly, we've said, as um, as I believe the Uniform Law does in Australia, that new business arrangements should be permitted. This has been the case in, in Scotland, England and Wales. The sky has not fallen in and it does allow some new arrangements that some clients will find useful. We do think it's really important that the firm in which an individual practices should be captured by the regulation because so often the problems that are reported, particularly cultural problems, issues of bullying, for example, come about because there's a, a systemic culture within that workplace. So being able to look at the work environment as well as the individual is important. Placing consumers at the heart of the of the regulatory framework. The 2006, the current legislation in New Zealand, thought that it had done that and was described at the time as a massive leap forward for consumerism. Well, consumers' needs and consumers' expectations change, and we think that the framework in New Zealand needs to go further in emphasising clients' rights to good quality care and information, including about fees. What's happened in our country is there's a sort of a standard practice of a, a you know a formulaic. These are our terms, and yes, they they will tell you the basis on which fees are charged, but you've got no realistic idea of the extent to which the clock's ticking and what the fees have built up to date. Uh, where's you know where is the work up to at this point? What's the end goal that we're seeking to achieve as lawyer and client? Much stronger emphasis on competence, assurance, and the regulation of lawyers, something that uh, in our country has been increasingly emphasised in, in relation to health practitioners, and that was the subject of, of the book that I wrote, um, but still not uh, as evident in, in some other professions, including the law. Give the regulator powers not just to discipline, but to intervene early. Maybe there's a mental health or an addiction issue, failing cognition. Try and support the practitioner back to safe practice, including by imposing um, conditions on the practice. And we've suggested that the current way of doing continuous professional development, CPD, is a bit of a blunt instrument. It has become a bit of a tick box exercise. We, um, we've looked to reviews of this internationally and suggested that uh, it's time for that to be refreshed. So complaints is a topic very dear to uh, the hearts of all professional associations I, I, I know and all, and all professions. Uh, that, that slide shows Moses parting the Red Sea. What do you mean it's a little bit muddy? So what's happened for the legal profession in New Zealand is a model that was intended to uh, have a focus on complaint resolution has been judicialized uh, and has really become a disciplinary system. That doesn't meet the needs of clients and complainants. Only a very small proportion of cases are, are, are really need to go down a disciplinary path. We think there should be a much greater emphasis on resolution of consumer matters, whether that's about communication or fees and moving away from 
the model that we've had of volunteer lawyers who are going to meetings once a month with up to 6,000 pages of papers, not an efficient system, a lot of rework uh, of documents. We believe that the system needs major reform uh, and um, that individual members of the profession should be subject to an obligation to sort out their own complaints promptly, fairly and free of charge. Far too many matters get escalated up to the uh, the regulator. So where do we end up? Just a reminder, Roxanne and others here believe greatly in the value of complaints and what we can learn. This was the message from, from John Milton back in 1644. When they are freely heard, deeply considered, and speedily reformed, get on and deal with the matter promptly. That is an, an, an utmost civil liberty. So there I am with the president of the New Zealand Law Society, Fraser Barton, on the 1st of March, and that beautiful interior is actually our Supreme Court, the ultimate court for, for our country. So the report is in three parts. We report on the status quo. We make the case for a new independent regulator. And then we go through in, um, various chapters, including a chapter on competence assurance and, and placing consumers at the heart, but also a chapter on complaints to set out what needs to happen. And we make eight major recommendations for reform. Our report is now with the New Zealand Law Society Board, which has said publicly it will report to the Minister of Justice by the end of July and take soundings from the profession. And that's happening right now. And as you would expect from some elements in the profession, there's a, quite a bit of pushback from, from some quarters, but it's, it's early days. But ultimately, a reform of this nature, like your uniform law, is going to take legislative will or political will, really. So there will a Minister of Justice, uh, who is willing to push this up the agenda. So time will tell and we have an election coming up in uh, in October. So the final slide is I, I leave you with an image. It's actually an image from our garden uh, at Kawakawa Bay, um, southeast of Auckland. And I kind of like the, the notion of, of partnership between the, uh, the provider, the professional and the and the consumer. And I've left my contact details there. But I think I'm at time, so I will... Pass back to Roxanne. Ron, thank you so much uh, for that presentation. Uh, we often look to New Zealand uh, to learn from your experience and uh, expert thinking, and uh, you have left us with some tantalising ideas and discussion points for later this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in uh, this balance between regulating for uh, the protection of title and regulating for safe and quality practice and the protection of consumers. And this is an issue that uh, uh, is very much a live one for professions and for associations uh, here in Australia. So thank you very much for that presentation. For now, we will go to our second speaker on the panel, Peter Gow, who was appointed the inaugural Western Australian Building Commissioner in 2011. He represented Western Australia on the Australian Building Codes Board for 15 years and has assisted in the implementation of the Building Confidence Report, uh, which was delivered to, uh, to ministers and the drafting of the National Registration Framework for Building Occupations. Peter is also the chair of the Professional Standards Committee of Engineers Australia. Uh, Peter, we are fortunate to also have you chair the Project Control Group for the Constructing Building Integrity Research Project in which the councils are a lead research partner. Peter, I invite you to, uh, to share with us how reviews are putting a renewed focus on professional standards in the building and construction industry and the role of professions and regulation in delivering a trustworthy industry. Thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. I come to you from Noongar Woodjack country in Perth, so I'm still able to say good morning to some people at least. And I think you'll find what I have to say will pick up and resonate with a number of the themes that Ron has outlined. There's a lot in this, but I think there are some important common themes that will come out. Right tools for the job. I'm sure we've all been down to Bunnings and bought a tin of paint. And you see that Bunnings employees have got these nifty little tools that lift the lid, they show you the colour, bang the lid back on. The, the lid's perfect. They've got a purpose-made tool for lifting the lid of the tin. When you get home, you haven't got one. 
So inevitably, we look around for something that'll do, and most of us will pick a, a screwdriver. So you lever the, the lid up with a screwdriver and off you go. But you will have noticed that the more you use the screwdriver on the tin of paint, the, the edge of the lid gets damaged and it gets harder and harder to deal with, but it sort of works. And the screwdriver is fine. You can still use it for putting in and taking out screws. But sometimes if you haven't got a screwdriver or you're in a bit of a hurry, you might look for anything else that's sort of flat with a bit of a thin edge to do the job and grab a chisel. Well, yeah, you can open the tin of paint with the chisel. It'll do a lot more damage to the lid than the, the screwdriver with. It will wreck the edge of the chisel so you can't actually use it as a chisel anymore and you run a fairly serious risk of actually doing yourself some damage. So underpinning a lot of this is the need to make sure that we use the right tool for the job, both to avoid doing damage to ourselves and, and getting long-term sustainability, um, but also not to wreck the tools that we've currently got. And, and in building, there has been a bit of a tendency sometimes to, to grab the first thing we think of to try and fix the problem rather than go back to first principles. And that comes out in some of the reviews I'll talk about. Second overall issue is the difference between property laws and consumer laws. So in building, there is a long history of property laws and the property owner being responsible for what happens on their property. If they want to build something on their property, it's up to them to make sure that they do it right, that they don't breach any of the laws, that they don't cause a dangerous building to be built, etc. And in a sense, this has got a couple of hundred years of history around property ownership being for the rich, people with the capacity to actually manage all the issues that might crop up on an individual property. But in Australia, certainly, and I suspect in other places, we've encouraged the mums and dads to get into property ownership, own your, your own home. It's a, it's a big deal. And it's brought a lot of benefits to people. But we find this coming into a little bit of shaky ground when we get to things like multi-storey apartments, where, to put it bluntly, when you have a, a, a strata company that's made up of working mums and dads responsible for looking after a sophisticated multi-storey building with difficult um, services and issues and that costs an absolute fortune if you want to do any maintenance work to it. We've maybe set up a situation where they're not well placed and they don't necessarily understand their roles as property owners. Against that, the average mum and dad consumer of, a, of an apartment or a property now has had 30 or 40 or 50 years growing up and working with consumer laws. And most of them think, I think quite understandably, that buying a unit off the plan or buying a unit is not that much different from buying a fridge or buying a car and you should get the same consumer protection and the same approach that if someone gives you a dud, they should fix it rather than it's your property and you're responsible for it, which is the, the traditional view. So we have this conflict both in the laws, but also the attitudes of the people as to what happens here. It's very messy and a lot of the issues that um, the reviews in the building sector have addressed are really trying to deal with this conflict between the traditional view of property and the, the modern view of what the consumer is entitled to. The final general comment I'd, I'd make is that building and property professions go over a very wide range and cover the full life cycle of the building. So you've got everything from town planning and initial land surveying at the beginning through the traditional ones we think about of architects and engineers and building surveyors and builders and so on who actually get the building built. But then we have the facilities managers, the property managers who look after the building in place, the strata managers who we now need to support the strata owners. We have real estate agents who buy and sell the property. Uh, we have valuers who have to come in and, and provide advice and, and so on. And a lot of the review and, and attitudes towards the building industry doesn't take this broad view. It's still very heavily focused on the construction of a building. And one of the advantages, I think, of, of some of the reviews that are coming up and certainly the Constructing Building Integrity Research Project is that it does have this broad view. So I'm really going to work off five reviews. Three have completed and two are still really underway. 
the main review into the building industry in the last decade or so is the Building Confidence Report that was commissioned by the Building Ministers Forum in 2018 and done by Peter Shergold and Bronwyn Weir. It was done in the wake of fires at La Crosse in Melbourne and then the, the Grenville disaster in, in London. And it's really been something of a process review, looking at process failures rather than structural reform in the, in the industry. It's got a lot of good recommendations which are process related that I won't go into. But for professional associations, the key one is that it argues that there should be registration of the key professions and trades and restriction of work in the building industry to those registered people. If we look around the country, there are jurisdictions such as Queensland, which already largely do this. So pretty much everybody under the sun in Queensland is, is registered. On the other side of the country in Western Australia, it's traditionally been very lightly regulated. So there is a, a strong recommendation that comes out of building confidence that you really need to make sure you've got competent people doing the work and you do that by registering them and restricting work to them. Following on from building confidence, the Victorian government commissioned an expert panel on building reform. It too largely looked at process, but it also looked at structure, particularly in Victoria and how the government agencies were structured and worked together. It largely echoed the recommendations of building confidence. It had a particular recommendation about building or developing competency frameworks, which might be differentiated from the initial qualifications to get registered in the first place. How do you have a framework to develop and maintain competency over the life of the professional? And it strongly recommends using professional associations accreditation schemes rather than reinventing the wheel, which supports a, uh, a model of co-regulation, which certainly in Australia was pioneered in Queensland with the Queensland Professional Engineers Act in 2002, and it's been picked up in other legislation since then. Finally, the Queensland Government has a comprehensive regulator in the Queensland Building and Construction Commission. It regulates, it deals with insurance, it has a very broad scope in terms of licensing trades and so on. And there were concerns about how it was operating, so a review went into its operation. So it's a review really about how does the regulation work. And two key things that came out of that, they felt that being a one-stop shop for everything created conflicts of interest which weren't being managed very well and that QPCC should really focus on licensing compliance and get out of the insurance business and education businesses and, and, and things like that. So it's very much saying you, you really need a dedicated tool for this job as, as licensing and compliance. Queensland's currently got running a review on the role of developers with the Queensland building and construction industry. This is the first time anybody, I think, has really had a proper look at the role of developers in this overall chain of who looks after a building from conception to demolition. And in particular, they're right in the middle of this conflict between the old property laws and the, the consumer laws and what consumers can expect to get out of a developer. So they're still taking submissions, but it will be very interesting to see what they come up with because in, in almost all of the regulation areas there's very little regulation of developers. And finally, we have the Constructing Building Integrity Research Project. This is a research project that's come out of, if you like, the, the research infrastructure in the country rather than government regulators or industry. But at the Sustainable Built Environment National Research Centre, which sets it up, is a combination of government, industry and, and academic stakeholders. So it's a reasonably broad-based group. The intention of this is to generate new knowledge about how these things work that we can build on the existing reviews, as to recommend improvements and increase awareness by professions and trades and regulators of the role that they play. So it's very focused on the, uh, the subject of this seminar. It's very appropriate that the professional standards councils are part of that process. So it's looking at how do you identify what are the professional standards that we are using at the moment, 
how is professionalism being applied in the emerging professions that are now recognised as being in the building industry and how do you develop building integrity systems? The main themes that come out of these, one has been a focus on construction rather than operation and maintenance. And I think that has been a limit to the formal reviews. As I mentioned, we need the broader view that we're now getting out of the current reviews. The second one is registration as a quality control measure. There is this sense that if you register people, you'll get better quality, that registered people can be trusted, will deliver good consumer outcomes, etc. There is a lot of truth to that, but it is a particular tool that does a particular job. And it works well to guard the gates. There's a focus with registration on initial competence and prosecuting people who aren't registered rather than policing the patch of the people who are. And in any quality control process, you need production sampling and testing. And if you're going to have registration, you need the registration authorities to be out there looking at what's going on and looking at the current practice, the current competency of the practitioners, not just the initial qualifications to get registered. So registration, in my view, can work as a quality control measure, but it has to be a holistic approach. Traditional registration has tended to be on get in, get the tick. Now you've got your ticket. We're not all that interested in you after that. Regulators have to regulate. And that's very much the view that came out of the Queensland Building Construction Review. There is an expectation that there will be a strong cop on the beat seen to be doing things. People, governments, consumers want to know that there is someone they can go to. And when they go to that person, they get some effective response. So regulation is, is an active process. It's not a passive process. The regulators need technical skills to actually be able to audit and investigate. In my own background in government, it's very common that the regulators will simply be generic public servants with a set of rules that they apply without great imagination. If you really want to get in and understand and audit and investigate, you need people who have the professional skills that you're trying to investigate. And that's a challenge for regulators. And there needs to be serious consequences that come out of the registration process. You know, that includes things like deregistration, going back and doing um, further study and, and so on. One of the problems that we get, and I'll mention this in a bit more detail later, you can't rely on professional associations if they don't have real teeth. You know, saying, well, you're not a member of our club anymore is not enough for effective regulation. There needs to be the ability to stop people doing work or to control the way that they do do work. Now, one of the things that can help that is co-regulation, where you try to draw on the strengths of the statutory regulators and the industry bodies. That has worked for 20 years in engineering in Queensland fairly well. And what you can do is you can give the statutory regulator real teeth, real investigatory powers, ability to bang down the door, take evidence, compel people to, to talk and so on, coupled with the technical expertise and the understanding of the system and the nuancing that might come out of engaging people from a professional association to work with this. And it works both in the initial registration process if you've gone through an assessment already to become a member of your, your association, there is probably no need to do that again just to prove the same thing in order to get registered. But it also applies in disciplinary matters where the regulator can use their powers, but they can also draw on the expertise from the, um, the professional association. And the other thing you get through co-regulation, which is particularly a thing in Australia, is that occupational registration is a state and territory based thing. And it's damn hard to get national consistency or national coordination. Whereas the industry associations, by and large, are national associations with a national set of standards and a national approach to things. So by the state and territory regulators working with the national associations, we can get much better national uniformity over things like standards and responses and so on. It's not perfect, but it's better than having no national view at all. Conflicts of interest are real 
and they exist throughout the whole process. There is inherently a conflict of interest if you're selling something to someone. You want to sell it for the highest price for the, for the minimum cost of input. On the other hand, you want to make your customer happy so that they come back. So that this trading quality control conflict of interest is inherent in a lot of the things that we do. But it becomes particularly an issue when you've got members and you're trying to represent your members, but you're also trying to represent the public interest. And professions traditionally have said the public interest must come first. And traditional um, professional associations based on the notion of the individual professional can only work by themselves, can't share their income with non-professionals, can only be in partnership with other professionals, etc. That that traditional view, which put the public interest first, you know, it still persists and it's still very important. But we also have a number of industry associations that have come in. They're there to represent their their members and to advocate for their members' interests to government and and so on and so they haven't had this public interest issue perhaps to cause conflict but as they come into a co-regulatory system or as they um, start to pick up professional standards and professional ethics and start to professionalize this becomes much more of a of an issue so co-regulation and conflicts of interest are an, are an interesting pair. So when we look at the role of professional associations, there is a fundamental question, you know, what sort of association are you? Are you the old professional trade guild? Are you a member advocacy group? More particularly, and this becomes more and more relevant, are you a organization of individuals as members? Or are you an organization that represents businesses, which may well be companies, firms, yes, sole traders. This is often mixed up in regulation, particularly in the building sector, where builders, for example, are typically businesses, architects are registered as individuals. So you, you really need to know what you are. Are you a standard setter or not? As I said before, do you set professional standards or are you more of a um, business advocacy group? It's important to know what you do. What's your membership profile? You know, is it national? Is it local? Is it businesses? Is it individuals? You really need to understand what type of association you are because some are better suited for a regulatory role than others. If you do set professional standards, are they linked to international standards? Do you just think you're setting national standards? Are you working locally just in a particular state and territory or, or just within your little member group? There is a role for, for all of these, but particularly if you're trying to align with international standards, you don't have complete freedom to work with local regulators. And when governments come in and start to uh, say, we're gonna set up a registration scheme, they may want to set standards that are different from what you've got. Do you have a building integrity system? Do you back this up with codes of practice, training, disciplinary processes, complaints processes, and so on? And how do you deal with edge cases? There's gonna be a lot of people who nearly qualify, but don't quite, but have been doing perfectly satisfactory work for a long time. When you bring in mandatory registration and limit work to registered people, that is a real issue that needs to be looked at. If you're assessing competence, how do you do it? You know, is it mandatory for your members to be assessed for their competence or is it a voluntary thing that you offer as an add-on? Do you do it through tick box processes? Do you have exams? Do you do professional interviews? There are a lot of different ways of assessing competence, some of which are a lot more rigorous than others. And do you have the tools necessary to assess the sort of competence that, that you need for membership in your association? Do you police standards? Yeah, is, is it your job to be out there as the policeman making sure people are performing properly and um, taking action against people who aren't? Or isn't that your job as an association? Professional associations working in a co-regulatory model with a, a government agency, who's policing the standards? Is it the regulator or is it the agency? Is it both? You've got to work out a way of working together. So that's quite important. Do you actually take disciplinary action and is it meaningful? Just telling someone that they can't be a member of your club anymore and may not be meaningful, but if you can get out, name names, et cetera, really have an effect, that, that's a, a much more important role for a professional association.
And finally, at, at the conflict of interest level, whose side are you on in a fight? Are you on your members' side? Are you there to advocate for your individual members? Or are you there to advocate for the public interest, the regulatory system, etc.? And co-regulation can put you in a bind as to who your constituency is and whose side are you really on. And finally, are you giving members what they pay for? An association has to provide value for money, basically. And if you're not giving members the support in terms of their professional development, looking after their, their interests, keeping the riffraff out, etc., they may not support your organisation. And this is particularly an issue, again, when government comes in with statutory regulation. You know, if you have to get registered by the state, what's the point of joining your organisation? So there's some real questions there that come out of, of these reviews, and I'll be interested to hear what the other speakers have to say and the discussion on, on these, because many of these themes are very similar to what Ron encountered in New Zealand. Thanks, Rosanne. Thank you very much, Peter. And as you say, I can see some themes emerging uh, just from what you have been uh, uh, speaking with us about and what... Ron raised with us earlier. Um, you've got some, some wonderful provocations there for us in terms of thinking about and understanding the role of regulation and ensuring that the right tools are being used for the right job. I don't think I'll ever do some painting at home again without thinking about regulation in the same, in the same moment. I'm really intrigued to by your models of co-regulation and this notion that you are taking a strengths-based um, approach to working with the right regulators in the various spaces where you can make a difference, whether it's insurance and education um, or registration and enforcement. Uh, where does that sit and, and who has the right tools to do it? So what a wonderful start to our forum this afternoon. Plenty of food for thought. As we've got two more presentations to go, to uh, we'll kick off again and go to our third speaker who is Michael O'Neill. Michael commenced the role of Chief Executive Officer with the Tax Practitioners Board in August 2018. He is a taxation lawyer with extensive public service experience. Michael joined the Tax Practitioners Board from the Australian Taxation Office where he was Chief Risk Officer following senior leadership positions in investigations advice, litigation and in private practice. Michael, I invite you to discuss the opportunities that a review can present for modernisation and ensuring standards and systems are fit for purpose. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, Roxanne, and good afternoon, everyone. It's um, a pleasure to be here today and uh, share some insights around continuous improvement and appropriate regulation consumer protection and professional standards issues alive for all of us. I'm privileged to come to you today from Nungawal country in the ACT. It's not my home. I live in Sydney in Gadigal country, but you can see uh, the beautiful hills of Canberra in the background. Many thanks to Ron and Peter for their insights. And I've had the advantage of a sneak preview of Tina Lisa's slides too. As to Ron's presentation, I think um, none of us can help but be inspired by the insights and beauty of New Zealand, and those regulatory reforms around the legal profession that speak to us more generally. I particularly appreciate Peter's Bunnings analogy. Uh, last weekend, I went to Bunnings and I bought my first nail gun. I haven't yet tried it. I really love that analysis of the important co-regulatory role of professional associations balancing the interests of the public and membership and recognizing the potential conflicts of interest there. The next slide gives a high level overview, perhaps to tell you what we do, who we are, and the importance of us as a small part of a big system. So the role of stakeholders and partners, including people like yourselves. The next slide goes to our uh, raison d'etre, if you like. I see three parts to the TPP's purpose. The first is around uh, supporting and improving public and consumer protections. The second is around enhancing professional and ethical behaviour of tax advisors. And the third around community confidence in the system. I've just numbered them one, two and three for simplicity's sake because they're all important and they're equally reinforcing in any good regulatory system. I think it's important to just uh, pause a moment for those three elements because while they speak to our statutory purpose at the TPB, they probably are equally applicable. You might be a professional service provider. You might be 
as a member of a firm, the leader of a firm, you might be uh, driving a professional association that's looking at that co-regulatory role or standard setting. You might be in the regulatory business, like the councils, the TPV, ASIC or APRA. It seems to me that there's elements of those three purpose statements that speak equally to each of us. There's been some recent publicity about the Tax Practitioners Board, a particular case involving a tax partner and an accounting firm. Today, I don't propose to cover any of the facts of those matters. They've been reported on our public register, and some of those issues have been subject to some parliamentary scrutiny here in Australia. But I'd like to say that in that case, and in some cases, we have the opportunity of understanding what are the underlying issues. And some of the underlying issues that can be extrapolated and develop lessons about professional behaviour more generally. So how do our particular compliance focuses, investigations, court cases, disciplinary decisions, draw out more fundamental values around integrity, confidentiality, management of conflicts of interest, those more universal themes? And on the back of that case, I'm very gratified to see that many professional associations in our sphere, many firms, many practitioners, professional service providers are in Ron's words, holding the mirror to their own services and saying, what can we improve? The next two slides uh, give a bit of the journey this afternoon. They give an overview of the key uh, TPB strategies. And I'd like to explore each of those nine very briefly. The purpose of that is to share our experience, to perhaps allow you to reflect on your own role, your own association, your own firm, do these strategies make any sense to you based on your own experience? And mostly to seek your feedback. And just as Ron has set before us, these are the lessons around uh, the regulation of the legal profession in New Zealand. Each of these discussions leads us to new insights and a better regulatory frameworks. The next slide talks to the qualification and eligibility standards. I think it's a hallmark of all our professions. In your world too, I'm sure the tax system has some level of complexity. One aspect of that is there might be about 15 million Australian taxpayers, and the majority of whom engage a tax advisor to help them with their affairs. The level of engagement varies from large and complex taxpayers, multinational corporations that have large tax teams, 100% coverage by tax advisors. Individuals with simple affairs might not be engaging tax advisors at the same rate. And business predominantly in Australia engage tax advisors to help them with tax, PAYGW, superannuation and other obligations. So implicit in those relationships are that the professional brings to the table their training, their experience. They bring to the table an important unseen, the ethical framework, the code of governance that supports their action. There's a standard around continuing professional education, the continuous growth that's um, being witnessed here today. And there's a recognition that there's consumer protections. For example, there's professional indemnity insurance if all goes wrong. There's a complaints resolution mechanism to help consumers re-engage. So those entry standards are the requirements which guide us in the regulation of 62,000 tax practitioners in Australia. The next slide talks about uh, supporting guidance. I'm reminded of this because my daughter, Nell, just got her provisional driver's license. In her first driving lesson, her instructor, Chris, said, you have to bring your father, he can sit in the back seat because there's no point me teaching you the rules if your father's going to give you bad advice tomorrow. So I think there's a key role for all of us in good regulatory systems around ensuring that the policy, the law, the rules, the bylaws are our professional associations. We have a system that's clear and understood. Obviously, continuing professional education has an important role here. And regulators and, dare I say, academic institutions share in this role of providing uh, guidance and support, encouraging people to do the right thing up front. It's a, a great part of supporting the profession and supporting the public. Our next slide refers to consumer protection measures generally, and the TPB provides support to the public and consumers of tax services, especially by supporting a very strong profession that's acting 
honestly and ethically. But more directly, we engage with consumers in a number of ways. Each year at tax time, we have an extensive advertising program, the theme of which is this. If you choose a tax advisor, choose wisely. But we say wise choices in this context are informed, informed partly by information about tax practitioners, which we include on our public register. We receive thousands of complaints or referrals every year, and I'm pleased to say the majority of those can be resolved very swiftly and informally. An example might be delayed services or funds. By early and informal engagement, nudging clients, nudging practitioners, bringing parties together to understand different points of view, a mutual resolution often leads to reinforcing longer-term professional relationships and also shaping and modifying behaviours, improving standards over time. One of the interesting features of our system is that over 50% of clients of tax advisors in Australia have long-term relationships. That is, they've been with the same tax advisor for five or more years. And I think that's a good external indicator of trust in the system. The next slide four relates to our risk assessment. How are we collecting data, analysing, and looking at the intelligence and informing our strategies around risk? Data management and security are front of mind for all of us, of course, in light of uh, recent hacks and leaks. And data science is providing extraordinary benefits for mankind, understanding the health of our system, addressing key opportunities and systemic risks. And for us, as a regulator of the tax profession, it's very important around identifying higher risk advisors that might be undermining consumer interests or undermining the system. We're equally alive to the fact that data science needs to be guided by lawful, ethical, practical considerations. In our organization, any TPP data insights are subject to human authentication and verification before any action is taken. Compliance and investigations is the uh, next strategy I'd like to talk to briefly. At the moment, the TPB has around 500 current compliance cases. These cases are focused towards the higher risk, those tax practitioners and unregistered advisors. Sometimes unregistered advisors operating without the necessary entry points of qualifications, experience, insurance frameworks. They're associated not just with mischief on the system, but with defrauding clients as well. And where clients come from a, a vulnerable group in our society, then the impact of unregistered misconduct is even greater. Investigations can obviously lead to direct outcomes for particular professionals, but what's important for us is the indirect benefits as well. Identifying the underlying issues, as I mentioned before identifying appropriate standards, informing future behaviour. As Ron mentioned, holding up a mirror to conduct and performance. That takes us to the next point, the issue about leveraged sanctions. I think every regulatory framework requires that transparency. All of our regulatory decisions are published and we try to publish the reasons behind those decisions. Uh, transparency is obviously important to community confidence. Transparency is a hallmark of systems that are just and fair. Anybody subject to a sanction by the TPB will have rights to review, either in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal or before the courts. The publication of reasons for the TPB is also a guidance and a continuous improvement. It reinforces high professional standards of the majority in the sector, and it clarifies the level playing field issues. None of us who are operating fairly in the system are going to see it as fair if those who are undermining the system are not addressed. The next slide uh, touches on stakeholder collaboration. I guess uh, uh, forums like this are a living example of, of the power of collaboration, as sharing insights, experience, ideals for reform. As a recognition, isn't there, that uh, we are each small parts in very complex ecosystems, whether it's regulation of health, the building industry, uh, legal advice or tax advice, small parts in a very connected world. All of us in leadership roles particularly have a role around testing the environment, understanding who are our key stakeholders, ensuring there's a voice, a forum, an opportunity for views and consultation. 
The TPB in particular has two forums for consultation with practitioners and professional associations. And another key aspect of our collaboration is semi-annually, we engage stakeholders, particularly practitioners and consumers, to test sentiment. Surveys give us two things, an insight into what's happening at a point in time, what's happening in the current environment, and we try to look at our survey results longitudinally. We have six sets of survey results, and the longer view is also informative for us. Proper governance is a key issue in our community. Our governments, our companies, our agencies like the TPB and regulators acting properly. Are we fulfilling our purpose? Are we effective? Are we spending public money wisely, efficiently? The TPB is governed by an independent board of eight. Those are people of professional experience and expertise in various fields appointed by the minister. Risk assessment guides our strategies as they do yours. And there's always a need for appropriate measures, how we are reporting internally and how we transparent as a public regulator to the government, the parliament and the public more generally. Uh, one benefit we had was an independent review ordered by the government in 2019 and conducted by Keith James. Keith is a senior experienced lawyer and accountant. That independent review has been a power of good. There were broad terms of reference, testing both our organization, the TPB, and our regulatory system. Our system of law is uh, one that's both ancient and uh, recent. The regulation of the tax profession has been a feature of the Australian tax system for about 80 years, but a national regulator for tax practitioners was floated as a notion about 20 years ago, and the TPB has only been in effect for 13 years. So Keith's uh, terms of reference said, is our regime fit for purpose? The process of review was very inclusive. He sought written submissions in the first instance had a range of town hall meetings to hear multiple views. He issued an interim report or a discussion paper to refine those views and possible recommendations before landing on those 28 recommendations in the slide. The majority of those recommendations were supported by the last government in full or in part, and some of those uh, have administrative implementation and others are matters uh, for law reform. Obviously, consultation is a key aspect of the next stage. Some of those law reform matters are currently before the parliament. There's a bill looking at five of those measures. And one of those measures is around clarifying the purpose and intent of the TPB. Another one is ensuring that the TPB is operating with greater independence, recognizing the separate but complementary roles of both the tax office as the administrator of the tax system and the TPB. Can I conclude then by just returning to our starting point? Are those purposes around uh, consumers, ensuring professional standards and community confidence in the system? We might talk about the regulatory framework for tax practitioners, the tax system, the super system. Might look at uh, healthcare complaints, the building industry, the standards of your particular industry. I think those three purpose statements are a great reason for us in the TPB to focus on our work. And I dare say, whether you're a professional out there in services land, whether you're driving an association, you're an educator that continues to challenge and inspire our growth, or you're a co-regulator like ourselves, those purpose statements might be meaningful for you. Thanks very much, Roxanne. Michael, thank you for um, that fabulous overview of not only your regime, but also the considerations in the Keith James review. I really liked your reflections around being in a connected world and echoing Ron's uh, contribution about holding up a mirror as regulators to the conduct and performance of practitioners. But I think there's also this really important um, holding up of a mirror through reviews to our work as regulators and whether we are meeting those expectations of the community and needs of the profession. And 
your your reflection that we're in a connected world and that it takes many players to get to the right outcome, I think it has been uh, really valuable. We're now going to go to our uh, fourth and final uh, speaker for the panel this afternoon. Um, I'm going to uh, call on Tina Lisa Sexton, who is a chartered accountant with a background in risk and financial management, governance and ethics. She has worked in the private, public, academic and not-for-profit sectors and was the National Professional Standards Advisor in Ethics and Corporate Governance at CPA Australia for 14 years until 2011. Tina is the Tasmanian nominated member of the Professional Standards Councils and I'd like to invite you now, Tina, uh, to reflect on the opportunities for associations to build fit-for-purpose regulatory systems and foster continuous improvement in professional standards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roxanne, and I'm here on Gadigal land as well. So on behalf of the Professional Standards Councils and our online forum participants, thank you so much, Ron, Peter and Michael. The Council selected Fit for Purpose Regulation Lessons from Reviews as the topic for this forum because the Professional Standards regulatory environment is ever-changing. To remain effective and responsive, it is vital that the life cycle of professional standard schemes include opportunities to assess the conditions in which they operate and take opportunities to improve their design and performance. Each of your informative and thought-provoking presentations has given us insights that we can use to help our continuous improvement efforts. I would like to draw together some themes from your presentations and reflect on how they relate to the work of professional associations and the councils. A fundamental reason for professional regulation is to protect consumers, and we all seem to be on the right page or the same page there, which is wonderful. It has been posited that where an occupational association functions both as a membership body and a regulator, the regulatory model must address the conflict between protecting the interests of its members and protecting the interests of consumers. The report of the independent review of the regulation of lawyers in New Zealand found that the loss of trust in the New Zealand Law Society as regulator may be ascribed to its dual functions. And it appears that these conflicts are also alive and well in the building and construction sector. It is therefore clear that there is a very real conflict to be managed here. How to balance the tension between representing a profession and regulating it. Failure to get the balance right means a profession may lose its confidence of the community and the government. As is being explored in the building and construction sector, direct statutory regulation may seem an attractive solution when risk management and complaints and discipline systems demonstrably fail to protect consumers from harm. It has the force of law and typically comes with a hierarchy of sanctions for breaches of compliance, which are understood by all. However, statutory regulation on its own runs the risk of regulating to a minimum standard and does not provide for opportunity for continuous improvement and elevation of professional standards. In Australia, we have seen statutory intervention in the regulation of health professions when consumers lost trust in self-regulation of health professionals dealing with a range of unacceptable behaviours. Despite this change from self-regulation to statutory regulation, there is considerable evidence that consumer trust in the current regulation of health professions remains low. From the Council's perspective, effective regulation is a hallmark of professionalism, a privilege of professionals, and to remove this can, in the longer term, diminish the strength of professionalism. How then to reconcile one body having responsibility for supporting its members at the same time as supporting consumers? In our view, mitigating the risk to professional reputation and loss of community trust in the profession can be achieved by being cognizant of and responding to com community expectations. The professional standards regime expects to see consumers at the centre of associations risk management systems with governance and regulatory systems built around this. Associations must step up to the privilege of self-regulation. Public interest must be the overarching interest to be served, which will in turn serve the interests of the association and its members. 
When constantly evolving, consumer needs and expectations remain at the forefront, addressed proactively rather than reactively. An association can regulate to an aspirational standard, striving to constantly improve and retain community trust, deserving of the badge of professionalism. Retaining the public trust is essential to ongoing self-regulation and ultimately the reputation and privileged position of the association and its members. The self-regulation comes with the responsibility to serve the public interest. To retain this privilege, professional associations need to hold their members to a higher standard. Failing to fulfil the regulatory mandate risks an otherwise self-regulatory association losing this privilege. With these things in mind, statutory regulation to a minimum standard could be seen as merely maintaining the status quo. The legislative framework under which the councils operate is premised on effective self-regulation in a co-regulatory environment. An association enters into a regulatory relationship with the professional standards councils voluntarily. When the councils approve a scheme prepared under professional standards legislation, a relationship is created between the councils, the occupational association and its members. Together, we work towards the fulfilment of statutory objects of improving occupational standards and protecting consumers of member services. This relationship involves the council as a meta-regulator of the association rather than a regulator. That is, the council's role is to oversee the association's self-regulation, not to regulate the members of the association directly. So by applying to have a scheme approved, an association is effectively asking an independent body to monitor and provide feedback on how well it is regulating the professional conduct of its members. We believe this to be a useful model to facilitate effective self-regulation by professional associations. It may be applied where there is no statutory or other regulator or operate in conjunction with one and contribute to the overall effectiveness of, of regulation. A benefit of this relationship is to strengthen the effectiveness of an association's own systems. At the same time, an association may be subject to external statutory or other regulation. It may be complementary or there may be overlaps. Nonetheless, the Council's interest as an oversight body is evidence of continuous improvement in standards and prevention of consumer harms. In co-regulatory models, statutory and professional regulation can operate side by side and become mutually reinforcing to provide better regulatory outcomes for the public. The Councils are of the view that professionals, for the most part, are motivated to do the right thing by the communities they serve. We believe that professionals who are motivated by self-interest and seek to protect themselves and their colleagues from public accountability are very much atypical. I might also note in passing that despite the voluntary nature of our regime, we have over 90,000 members of various professional bodies participating. Our function, in simple terms, is to help associations do better at regulating their members' professional behaviour. A recent Four Corners program highlighted significant gaps in the professionalism of real estate agents, despite existing statutory regulation and audits by the regulator. Such gaps in professionalism undermine public trust and confidence in all sectors, and especially here in real estate professionals. Would oversight by a meta-regulator help address this problem? Who knows? How can we ensure that regulation remains fit for purpose in a changing environment? How can associations ensure that their standards and systems keep pace with community expectations? This is in large part derived from the results of research and reviews. Reviews of or by associations are important continuous improvement tools. From the perspective of the professional standards regime, regulatory reviews are intended to improve the quality of regulation through a robust, transparent and evidence-based process to identify how operational and quality problems are most effectively addressed, all the while serving the public interest and assuring consumer protection. In the context of the work of the councils, this is achieved by the Annual Professional Standards Report or APSR 
which encompasses statutory and policy reporting requirements of occupational associations with approved schemes. As a meta regulator, we look at what measures an association is taking to ensure consumers of the member services are protected from harms. We look at governance and compliance systems and identify improvements in risk management and complaints and discipline systems. We provide feedback to an association to assist with effective self-regulation. Associations' annual compliance reports to councils focus very strongly on improvements in consumer-focused risk management processes. This is a statutory reporting obligation. We ask associations to provide professional indemnity claims data, to look at the underlying causes of claims, to provide details of consumer complaints trends, and to demonstrate how these data are used to inform continuous professional development programs. Under this model, meeting consumer and community expectations is essential to member service provision rather than conflicting with it. We monitor the ongoing performance of associations, professional regulatory systems and the regulatory environment in which they operate. Formal feedback from associations annual reporting provides an opportunity for councils to comment on whether systems remain responsive and fit for purpose and offer suggestions for improvement. We would argue that a meta-regulator with oversight of professional association self-regulation is an effective mechanism to ensure that associations improve their professional standards and respond proactively to consumer expectations. The Professional Standards Council and other regulators, including, of course, self-regulatory professions, are very much part of a community. Accordingly, it is of vital importance to see the points of commonality across our regulatory roles. A good example of this is the memorandum of understanding that the Professional Standards Council has with the Tax Practitioners Board. Being supportive of one another and sharing our learnings, the regulatory ecosystem will improve. Supporting the bodies we regulate and operating from an understanding that most professionals will strive to act professionally, but may occasionally need advice and direction to do so, will further improve the regulatory system. Thank you. Thank you, Tina, and thank you for bringing uh, the Council's perspective into the, into the presentations and conversations as well. a member of the engineering profession with deep experience in the good governance of professions as a former chief executive of the Association of Professional Engineers, Scientists and Managers Australia, as well as a director of a variety of companies. I'm glad to invite John to make some closing remarks. Good afternoon, everyone. I could just uh, indicate I'm also from uh, speaking to you from Gadigal Country today and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'd particularly like to thank our four speakers today, Ron Patterson, Peter Gow, Michael O'Neill and Tina Lisa Sexton. I think the presentations have really uh, shone a lot of light on the issue of um, fit for purpose regulation. And I guess one of the things that has come through to me is the need for a contemporary approach. Whilst the legislation that we operate in might be OK, it's the application of that uh, legislation in a contemporary sphere that is uh, so important, along with, of course, the focus on the on the consumer and also uh, the issue of regulation versus representation was also I think a very interesting discussion and something that we always need to be mindful of. The other point that I a couple of points I was quite interested in was the um, suggestion from Peter Gow that co-regulation uh, provides the basis for a greater a greater opportunity for a national approach because the associations involved in the main are national associations and I think that that's one way of um, perhaps um, overcoming the, um, the uh, complexities of our federation. And then Tina's comments about co-regulation and uh, particularly noting that the council's role was that of a meta-regulator, I think was uh, an important contribution, particularly in terms of the focus that um, the councils provide on ensuring that the uh, operators of our schemes, the managers of our schemes, a focus on continuous improvement. And as part of that process, there's also a great opportunity for the internal processes of the associations to, to benefit from um, that continuous improvement approach. So um, could I uh, again thank our speakers and uh, also thank our participants today for their, for their questions and, and contributions.
And uh, finally, thank uh, Roxanne and the uh, Office of the Authority for the um, work that they've done in uh, putting on this uh, forum. And thanks very much, everyone. And I'll hand back now to Roxanne. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and uh, I add my thanks to one and all. Uh, that brings us to the close of the forum for this afternoon. Our next forum will be in person in October this year with a focus on practical tools to support the operation of professional standards schemes. I hope we will see many of you in Sydney for that event. Uh, for now, thank you and good afternoon. <laughs>